you're going to learn the 10 trading mistakes you must avoid if you want to start winning games. From simple fixes to stop getting hit by every skill shot the enemy throws at you, to how to set up easy solo takedowns on the enemy laner every game, and how standing behind your minions to block spells is actually losing you lane, along with so much more. For example, most players already know to harass the opponent on their last hits, the enemy stops moving, making it easy to land damage while they're distracted and can't fight back. What players don't know is the technique challenger players use called faking CS. If you notice the opponent is consistently throwing their ability on your last hit timing, then you might want to pretend to go for CS a bit early, but fake out at the last second to dodge their spell. Not only does this save you HP, but it also lets you punish the opponent for having their abilities on cooldown. This can then result in a good trade, or simply allow you to push the wave favorably. What you just learned is step 5 in our brand new training course for Season 14. This course has been getting perfect 5-star reviews by players just like you, and is a part of our massive update, adding all brand new courses for for season 14. To celebrate this, we're offering a limited time discount through the link below. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description below to get the rank you've always wanted this season. All right, now the first mistake every player makes when it comes to trading is not understanding how the mechanic of spacing sets up winning trades. Spacing is when you move in and out of an enemy spell's max range to bait them to waste it. Bad spacing looks like this, where there's no awareness of the enemy's spell's range, and so you stand inside it, making yourself easy to hit. Good spacing looks like this, where you are aware of the spell's max range, while walk into it, but then preemptively click out. This then tricks the opponent into thinking they can hit you, putting their spell on cooldown. Here's the mistake though, good spacing isn't enough to set up winning trades. It would be like if you're a boxer and can dodge every punch thrown at you, while you never actually throw a punch back. You can't win a fight that way. Instead, the whole point of spacing is to create timing windows for your attack, or in other words, dodging to then set up the counter punch. For example, by spacing well against Yone's E and third Q, it now means there's a timing window for Ari when those abilities are on cooldown. So now the time to play aggressive and look to land damage as Yone can't fight back. Then once the third Q comes back up, again, back to spacing properly and off the miss, you punish by landing some of your own spells. You can also apply this from the role of the aggressor. For example, here, Ash looks to space aggressively, threatening to land a W and run down Smolder with autos, scaring Smolder into using his escape spell. Now, Ash has a timing window to go aggressive with it on cooldown. So, when Smolder makes the spacing mistake of walking too close, Ash pulls the trigger, and you can see how not only does this turn into a takedown on smolder, but then Morgana after, into then even taking down the enemy jungler. A triple kill was all set up from this one concept. When it comes to both winning trades and setting up solo kills, spacing effectively to bait spells from the enemy is often what's needed to then set up the takedown after, when that key spell is on cooldown. And this is a perfect transition to our second mistake, not understanding that often the threat of a spell can be better than actually casting it. For example, here we have a bot lane matchup of Ash, Janna against Smolder Morgana. Morgana's entire threat comes from landing a bot. What prevents Janna or Ash from aggressively running at her or Smolder is the threat that they'll run straight into that bind. Instead, watch what happens when Morgana doesn't hold that spell and instead looks to aggressively land it. Instant punish as Ash and Janna are safe to rain down harass. You'll see how this one mistake loses Morgana's lane. Morgana throws out a random Q again, time to punish, landing free damage and zoning them from the wave to guarantee the push lead. Eventually, after enough times making this mistake, it leads to her inevitable death. Now, here's the thing, it doesn't mean Morgana can't cast any ability, she's still free to cast her W, E, and use auto attacks, but she needs to understand to hold her Q in this matchup as a reaction to the enemy. Here's a great example on how to do this correctly. Ari sees Diana coming back to lane and naturally could try to land an aggressive charm, but risks missing it. But by holding the charm, it means if Diana tries to engage, she's guaranteed to land a point blank charm, leading to an easily won trade. This one concept is absolutely key to being able to win trades in a lot of matchups and is often something players don't even realize is a thing that exists. Now, our third third trading mistake is a quick one. You see, when players first learn about trading around cooldowns, they often take it too literally, meaning they literally don't move to trade until the exact moment their spell comes off cooldown. This is very similar to a mistake players make around level 2 spikes. Often players will sit far back, hit level 2, and then try to go aggressive, but the enemy just backs off. It's much more effective to preemptively move closer to the opponent while you're still level 1 than spike level 2 catching them off guard. You can use a similar concept with trading around cooldowns. Here, you can see RU's W to harass Vex. Now it's on cooldown, so Vex thinks she's safe to move up to the wave. However, Vex still has to kill a caster minion and melee minion to hit level 2. So you'll see Ari move in aggressively despite her W still being on cooldown for a few seconds. Here's the thing, by the time her charm crowd control expires and she's looking to disengage, her W comes back off cooldown, letting her use it as she walks out of the trade, all before the melee minion dies to give Vex level 2. So, starting a trade slightly before your ability comes off cooldown can actually be a great way to catch opponents off guard since they'll assume 
it's still on cooldown. All right, now let's talk about the common mistakes players make when trading around minions. Firstly, when players start trying to trade around cooldowns and using spacing, they end up tunneling on this for the entire laning phase. As the game progresses, your ability to wave clear faster increases. This means often one of the best strategies if you're a ranged champion is to simply get the push advantage. Then, once the enemy is distracted, having to last hit minions under tower, you can then fish for easy poke. The best part is if you do this successfully, the enemy is often too low to fight back on the next wave. This results in you pushing it in again, and once again, continuing to land poke as they try to farm under tower. Now, the opposite is true if you're a melee champion. Pushing can actually result in your enemy being able to play much safer since you're unable to engage on them without taking turret aggro. This is why when you do push as a melee champion, it's actually better to use that timing to either roam on a side lane or do a fake roam where you try to bait the enemy mid to follow your roam and then engage on them outside the safety of their tower. And if you don't do those, well, then you should be looking to push into then recalling to purchase items. This is because if you push a big wave into a tower, it rebounds back towards you. And so as you walk back to lane, the wave is now on your side of the map, giving you an opportunity to engage on the opponent for winning trades and potential all-ins. Now, the next mistake players make when it comes to trading around minions is that they take trades when the enemy is building up a big wave that's pushing towards them. There are several reasons why this is so bad. First is that if you lose the trade, well, you can't really recall as the enemy will just push the wave into the tower and then you lose all those minions to the turret. At the same time, if you lose the trade, you can't stay in lane after as they're just going to look to turret dive you. Since even if they trade one for one, it's going to be winning for them due to the fact that you'll lose the massive wave after you die. Now, obviously, we're not saying just because an enemy has a big wave, it means you can't trade with them. However, between levels 1 to 6, it's nearly always a bad idea. This is because early on, minions do way more damage as you haven't bought items or leveled up enough to outscale them. At the same time, the person who has the minion lead has killed more minions, meaning they likely have an experience lead on you. So you can get caught out by them spiking levels 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. This is why, at least level 6 and below, you should only ever be trading with someone when they have a big wave advantage over you if you know 100% you can win that trade. Otherwise, it's far too risky. And if you want to learn more about how to use minions to win your lane, then I highly, highly recommend you take our brand new wave control course at skillcap.com. It will teach you everything you'll ever need to know in just 12 easy steps, and you can check it out with that discount link below. Anyways, the next mistake players make when it comes to trading around minions is that they stand in their minion wave. It makes sense why people fall for this. I mean, if you're facing Ezreal bot, stand in your wave and use minions to block his Q. Facing Ari mid, stand in the wave to block the charm, right? Well, no. If you do that, you're letting Ari get what's known as a double value spell. They get to both harass you and get the push advantage at the same time. The thing you have to realize is when you stand outside of the wave, the enemy has to pick between either pushing or trying to trade with you. And if they choose to push with their abilities, well, that sets you up for the cooldown punish we taught you earlier. Now, when you're facing someone who both has an ability that can go through minions, like Lux E, and an ability you can block with minions, like Lux Q, the trick is you can still stand behind minions like here, blocking the Q, but you stand far enough from the minions that if they throw the ability that goes through them, so Lux's E, it can only hit either you or the minions. In this case, Lux goes to land an E on Ari, and you can see how the spell has no value, since it doesn't also damage the wave when she misses. Another trick is to use melees to block one spell while standing away from your casters, so they can never hit both you and your caster minions. Or an even more advanced trick is to hang out behind but to the side of minions. This way, if they use a spell that can be blocked by minions, you move behind it. And if they use their spell that goes through minions, you just move away from them. Either way, the most common mistake I see players make is standing dead center in the middle of their casters, which is guaranteed to give the enemy double value spells. Fixing this one mistake can often win you lane early on, since if the enemy goes for you instead of the minions, you get that early push lead. And if they go for the minions instead of you, it sets up early winning trades. Now, the final mistake players make when it comes to trading a around minions is that they don't understand the concept of last hit turns. For example, here it would be a mistake for Ari to try and go for a trade, because if you look at the minions, Swain's minions are much lower in health, meaning Ari will have to move in to last hit first. Compare that to Ari's minions, Swain won't have to last hit for a while. So, this is Swain's turn to try and harass Ari while she has to last hit. You can see how the enemy Swain isn't aware of this concept, and so isn't going aggressive during Ari's turn to last hit. Meanwhile, Ari makes sure to focus on getting her turn to last hit over and done with before going aggressive herself. Great, her last hits are out of the way. In this case, Ari chooses not to go aggressive off Swain's last hits and instead focuses down a minion to spike level two first. Notice how when both players have to last hit at the same time, it typically means both play defensive and nothing happens. Now that Ari's level two, look at the minions again. Swain is the one with the last hit timing, baiting him to move forward despite being down a level and setting up an easy winning trade for Ari. If we jump forward just a few seconds, you can see the exact same concept winning Ari her lane. She takes a more defensive stance, getting her last hits out of the way, and Swain makes the mistake I'm not trying to trade during that time. Then, right after, it's Swain's turn to last hit, and Ari immediately punishes him for it. So, always try
try to time your trades during your opponent's last hit turns, and avoid trying to go aggressive during yours, as you'll then often give up your own last hits and fall behind in gold. Now, our eighth mistake has to do with tracking level ups. By now, most players actually know how to track the level two and level three timings of their opponent. Sure, in lower elos, you can sometimes still catch players with level two and level three all-ins, but even then, it's much rarer than it used to be. However, the one level spike that catches even challenger players is the level six spike. This is because between levels one to six, a ton of things have happened, whether it's kills in lanes, recall timings, or having to react to fights in the river. And so, which laner has the XP lead often gets lost. Here's the thing, there's actually an easy trick to tracking the level six timer. It just starts with paying attention to when you hit level five. For example, notice here how Ari hits level five on this wave when the siege minion dies and there's three minions left. Great, so now we just have to watch when the enemy Yone hits level five. In this case, we can see Yone hits five on the next wave. Whenever the enemy laner hits five, just check your own XP bar and you can see how Ari is ahead nearly half a level in XP. This is how Ari knows she'll have the level six spike in this game and can look to set up the all in as soon as she spikes level six on Yone. Here's another example. Fizz hits level five with three caster minions left in the current wave and another six minions in the next wave. So he's farmed nine more minions of XP after he hit level five. Shortly after, you can see Ari hits level five when there's only two caster minions left in the wave. So she only farms two more minions of XP after she hit level five. So if you really want to be specific, Fizz is ahead seven minions worth of XP. So when Fizz recalls and gets back to lane, despite losing one minion of XP to the tower, he knows he's still six minions ahead. So as his XP bar is one minion from leveling up, he positions himself to be able to level six all in Ari, catching her completely off guard for the free kill. And speaking of level six, the mistake we see players make all too often is all inning way too early once they unlock their ultimate. You see, unless you're already fed or have some big lead, it's very rare that a champion can just 100 to zero someone as soon as they're level six with their ultimate. And if you use your alt and the enemy didn't, well, sure, you force them into a bad recall, but you now don't even have your ultimate, meaning it's not like you can just go off and try to roam as you're significantly weaker. Then once the enemy gets back in lane, well, you can't really fight them anymore due to the alt disadvantage. If you try to fight for lane control, well, you're often just dying 1v1 due to the alt disadvantage, so you give up the lane, which leads to them having map pressure and being able to roam or set up kills. This is what's known as knowing your kill threshold. For example, here you can see Ari has alt against Talia. However, again, rarely is anyone's kill threshold 100 to zero, so she's not wasting her alt. In a squishier matchup like this, a good rule of thumb is likely you have to hit someone with your poke spell to put them to around 70% of the max HP before you can all in them. And now that Talia is around Ari's kill threshold, Ari can alt and look for the all in. You can even see how once all of Ari's abilities are on cooldown, it's basically the last auto that kills Talia, any higher in health and she would likely get away. Here's another example of good awareness of kill thresholds. Ari is going to spike level 6 over Diana, however, she hasn't really landed any poke damage to set up the all-in, so she simply does an ult. You can see how Ari is consistently looking for that poke damage to land so she can then all-in but keeps missing her Q. Now in this case, making sure to hold ult and not wasting it and then just losing all lane pressure didn't actually turn into like a game winning roam, but instead it actually made it so that she could turn on the enemy jungler when he ganked her. Now, to be clear, we're not saying just never use your ult and play scared. Limit testing and trying to all in, but then not having enough damage is how you're going to learn what your kill threshold is. What we are saying is that whenever you do all in someone and they live, always check how much health they lived with. For example, if it's 10% of their max health, great. You now know your kill threshold against that champion. All you have to do is check their health level before you all in and deduct 10% of their max health from it. That's your kill threshold. The real mistake isn't all inning someone and them living. It's never using that as a way to learn your kill thresholds for the next all in or future games. Now, our final trading mistake has to do with reading an enemy's body language. I want you to pay attention to Swain's body language during this early laning phase. Notice how he's never once going to move in front of Ari's melee minions. However, then once Ari is pushed up, notice Swain suddenly positioning much more aggressive, despite being down in health compared to Ari. He's trying to land his E, despite his Q being on cooldown, and then right after tries to land a W while his E is on cooldown, and then starts running at Ari past the melee minion line, despite his E and W being on cooldown. If your opponent has been playing more defensive and passive throughout the laning phase, and then suddenly is looking to aggressively trade with you despite being at a health or cooldown disadvantage, he's pretty much always trying to set up a gank for his jungler, especially if you're the one that's pushed up. This is why, despite Ari having all abilities off cooldown, she chooses to just walk back and play safe. And sure enough, what do you know, there's the enemy Kane looking to gank. Same concept in this example, I want you to pay attention to Twisted Fate's body language. He's playing very scared and defensive, and then out of nowhere, despite being down in health and a level, is suddenly positioning hyper aggressive trying to land a gold card. This is an 
an obvious tell that Ari is getting ganked, so she kites back to the safety of her tower. This was not only key in letting her survive the gank without having to blow Flash, but also putting both Twisted Fate and Viego super low on health. Now, those examples are great when escaping is an option. However, you should also be on the lookout for this to help indicate when you should turn on the enemy to trade kills. For example, here you can see the enemy Smolder and Morgana are positioning very defensive and safe. They're very scared of Ash and aren't looking to initiate any trades. Then, suddenly, Morgana starts positioning way more aggressive. At the same time, Smolder is moving up as well, playing more aggressive than before. Now, let's pause here. So, there is a very good chance Ash and Janna are getting ganked. However, when both you and the enemy are low in health, often trying to run away will just result in you getting killed by the full HP enemy jungler, especially when you're on a long side lane pushed up and playing an already squishy champion. So, instead of running away, where you'd likely just die for free, you want to look to try and trade kills with the enemy. You can see how Ash immediately looks to all in Morgana, and when the Smolder ult is casted, it's an instant ghost pop anticipating the enemy Volley Bear gank. And from here, it's a constant dance trying to fake like Ash is going to run away, but really, she's just trying to bait the enemy bot lane to overextend so she can trade kills. Keep in mind, the enemy Volley Bear just revealed himself on the map, wasted his time ganking only to go even with the enemy. At the same time, Volley Bear got one of the kills, while Ash got two kills, so Ash actually comes out ahead of Smolder from this gank. Basically, the mistake players make is they win trades, then the enemy just plays super passive and scared. Then suddenly, they go hyper aggressive, and they don't realize that's an obvious tell they're getting ganked, and so they fall for the trap and throw their lead. Now, if you truly want to become a master of trading, there is nothing better than our brand new trading course at skillcap.com. We'll take you step by step, teaching you everything you need to know about trading in League of Legends. This course has been getting perfect five star ratings by players just like you, and is a part of our massive update, adding all brand new courses for season 14. To celebrate this, we're offering a limited time discount through the link below. So click the link in the description below to get the rank you've always wanted this season. All right, and that will do it for this one. We here at Skillcap want to thank you for watching, and we'll catch you in the next one.